Muncie, Indiana, Middletown, USA, the crossroads of America, home of Garfield the Cat, the joy of painting with Bob Ross, and Ball State University. Muncie was once the center of industry. The discovery of natural gas in the late 1800s attracted manufacturers like the Ball Brothers Glass Manufacturing Company to relocate to this booming industrial Midwestern city. The Ball Brothers made Muncie their home, and their legacy and generosity can be seen throughout the community. But Muncie has another benefactor whose legacy lives on in the heart of downtown Muncie, Andrew Carnegie. The Carnegie Library, constructed in 1902 with funds from philanthropist Andrew Carnegie, is one of Muncie's community treasures. An architectural beauty in the heart of the city, the library stands as a testament to the valued place not only on equal access to information, but also on the importance of preserving our community's history. Historic preservation of an Indiana landmark like this comes with many challenges. It takes the support of a community to keep community treasures like this alive for future generations, but the rewards far outweigh the costs. The Muncie Public Library is dedicated to maintaining this historic Indiana landmark, and so we are taking a closer look at where we came from, where we are, and where we're going. We're consulting the experts and taking steps to ensure the future of our Carnegie Library a community treasure. Andrew Carnegie spent over $55 million of his wealth on libraries, the equivalent of almost $1.7 billion today. For this reason, he is often referred to as the patron saint of libraries. Andrew Carnegie's father, William, died when Andrew was only 20 years old. Andrew's desire to help take care of his family pushed him to educate himself and become an avid reader. He later supported libraries because he believed that in America, Anyone with access to books and the desire to learn could become successful, just as he had done. As an immigrant from Scotland, he also felt that libraries played a key role in helping immigrants acquire cultural knowledge. In keeping with this ideal of providing free access to information for all, the Muncie Public Library's mission is to provide accessible and innovative services responding to the reading, informational, educational, and enrichment needs of the community. It is fitting, then, that when over a century ago, once he was in need of a new library, the city turned to Andrew Carnegie for assistance. The Muncie Public Library was established in 1875 as a small reading room in the city building. Muncie was a growing industrial city then, and it wasn't long before the population was in need of a dedicated library facility. On February 21st, 1901, the Muncie Library Board met and decided to write a letter to Andrew Carnegie to ask for a $50,000 gift to the city of Muncie for library purposes. Andrew Carnegie had just sold his steel company to J.P. Morgan for $480 million and devoted his life to philanthropy with special emphasis on local libraries. Muncie's commercial club submitted a letter to which Mr. Carnegie replied he would be happy to donate the $50,000 on the terms that the city spent $5,000 each year for the upkeep of the library. The city council accepted, and with an additional donation from local county clerk and banker George W. Spilker, the city was able to purchase land downtown at the corner of Jackson and Jefferson Street. The library was designed by Marshall S. Mahuron of Fort Wayne, and the construction contract was awarded to Morrow & Morrow of Muncie. Mahuron's architectural firm was known for designing several Indiana County courthouses, and his design of the Muncie Public Library attempted to immortalize both the neoclassical aspirations of the 19th century and Andrew Carnegie's generous donation to the community. Constructed of Indiana limestone, the building harmonizes Greek and Roman classical architectural forms. The northern facade of the building depicts carved muses and two semi-reclined human figures of cut stone encompassed by classically inspired ornamentation. Flanking the entrance are two finely carved and well-preserved panels of sculpted muses, including law, science, and prose. Inside, the central feature of the main floor of the library is a grand Roman classical dome containing stained glass and supported by freestanding columns. Muncie laid the foundation for the library building on June 1, 1902. When construction was completed in 1904, the library faced a dilemma. They had a grand new building, but not enough books to put on the shelves and funds were low for equipment and furniture. The president of the library board, Theodore F. Rose, came up with an idea, and the board commissioned a souvenir spoon with an image of Carnegie Library engraved in the bowl. The golden spoon was presented to Carnegie's young daughter, Margaret, along with a letter of the board's thanks for her father's gift to the city of Muncie. 
The letter also mentioned that the new library was lacking in proper books and equipment. Mr. Carnegie was so pleased by the gift that shortly thereafter, he gifted an additional $5,000 for books and furniture for the new library. When Andrew Carnegie died in 1919, the Muncie Public Library closed for the day for his funeral and reported to the local newspapers that his death called to mind his remarkable life and many generous acts and gifts which made him the greatest philanthropist of his age. The Carnegie Library remained the only public library building in Muncie until the second branch opened in 1930. Carnegie Library then became the main branch of the library system. The system continued to grow with additional branches opening around the city. In later decades, Muncie became part of the Rust Belt as factories shut down and the population of the city declined. The internet created cultural shifts in how we acquire information and entertainment. Consequently, a transition occurred in both the role and the funding of the public libraries. The Muncie Library System decided to merge the historic Carnegie Library with the local history and genealogy branch. This would allow Muncie Public Library to continue sharing Muncie and Delaware County's unique stories from one downtown location. It would no longer be a circulating branch, but would provide ample space for the growing collections of local history documents and artifacts, and would be dedicated to digitizing and making these records available to researchers all over the world, something Andrew Carnegie would be proud of. Muncie's Carnegie Library is one of the only public library branches fully dedicated to local history and genealogy, and its local history database is one of the largest in scope of any public library. The Carnegie Library is also a gathering place in downtown Muncie. The meeting space is utilized for public meetings, cultural events, and educational programs. It is fitting that Carnegie Library continues to be a beacon of knowledge and research, a place to exchange information and ideas. In 1976, Carnegie Library was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. This register recognizes Carnegie Library worthy of preservation for its historical significance. In 2002, the building underwent a complete remodel to modernize electrical systems, heating and cooling, and accessibility, while still maintaining the historical architectural features such as the stained glass dome, exterior relief sculptures, and columns. Historic buildings require continual care and can be challenging to maintain, but it's worth the effort. Carnegie Library is lucky to be a part of a revitalized downtown Muncie. Over the past several years, downtown has seen many historic buildings refreshed, a thriving new community of businesses, residents and students, exciting community events, and a return to the original Muncie. Just as the Carnegie Library is part of Muncie's history, we want to see this historic building as part of Muncie's story yet to be written. We hope that you will join us in preserving this Indiana landmark, this community treasure. So Andrew Carnegie built these types of libraries all across the nation, but he built more in Indiana, I think, than any single state. I think he built 164 in Indiana, and um, I, I can't remember how many are still standing. 154 may still be standing, but 98 of them are actually still libraries in the state of Indiana. They're all very high quality structures. They're all very distinct structures. They may be made out of uh, different materials. Uh, the one here in Muncie is limestone. There's some made out of brick, but they are distinctive and they're purposeful and they are high quality. And he did that up for a reason because he's not even a Hoosier. So he, he, he believed in the mission of libraries. He believed in the mission of literacy and public libraries. And at that time, philanthropy built good quality buildings. Carnegie, I've learned in some of my research, actually had a good deal of influence over the, over the design of his libraries. Um, he and his private secretary actually published floor plans. Um, what, what was kind of happening was that certain towns, from what I was reading, um, didn't maybe have the architect that had the skill set to truly build a viable and sustainable library. Um, so one of the things that Carnegie did was he began to put out recommendations. Um, how powerful his recommendations were, we don't know, but they did put out floor plans. The um, architectural firm of Wing and Mahirin of Fort Wayne were the designers of the library. Uh, their designs uh, really expressed the diversity of architectural concepts. Um, and they designed uh, many distinguished and well-designed structures in Indiana including the Monroe County Courthouse, 
in Bloomington. Uh, they did the DeKalb County Courthouse in Auburn um, and numerous buildings in Fort Wayne. I actually bumped into a feasibility study that was performed by James and Associates uh, in 1974. Um, it had a complete analysis of the feasibility of the building and a lot of information on the architectural significance. It is an imaginative combination of Greek and Roman classical elements and details. Although the facade is a Greek Doric hexastyle expression with the well-proportioned pediment that defines a series of finely sculpted elements, the overall silhouette of the dome central space is more reminiscent of Roman classical forms. This is precisely why the building is of considerable architectural interest. It illustrates an interesting combination of both classical periods into a successful solution. It is quite unique to experience this combination of forms and other monumental public edifices in this part of Indiana. Indeed, it is difficult to recall a similar combination of forms in an early 20th century example in Indiana. The James and Associates, when they were evaluating the building, um, quoted this exact line, to my knowledge, they did not use this unique combination of Greek and Roman forms in any other solution they developed. Certainly, the library is more than a rival to any other public buildings designed for Muncie. If this was written in 1974, that means that the statement is even more important now than ever. Prior to becoming the Archivist for Architectural Records, um, I'm a practicing conservator, architectural conservator, accredited with the American Institute of Conservators. Um, and one of the, some of the things that I've learned in my, my trades, the number one enemy of a building is water. Your envelope to this building has to be sealed. Water is a wonderful thing, but it's terrible to the inside of your building if it's not in a sink or glass. So you could uh, not have, you could have water infiltration and not know it for the longest time until it's almost too late when it comes to uh, roof structures, wall structures, foundation issues. So making sure that your envelope is sealed is always the number one deal with a um, old historic home. The number two enemy of a building is poor repair, bad maintenance. And it is all too common when we look at prices um, that we cut corners. Um, we don't want to do that here because you will find that those corners that you've cut, although might save you money in the short term, are actually going to pile on top of you in the long term. They will exponentially increase and you will find yourself in a very terrible situation while you've put at risk your original building fabric. You just have to look in terms of long term and that's, I think, one of the biggest problems with preservation. Um, homeowners today typically don't live in their houses for very long. So when they're faced with a repair for windows or for a roof, they're looking for the cheapest option because this is not the house that they maybe are intending to keep for the duration of their life. In terms of public buildings, the equation changes. We're going to stay in this building for as long as for the foreseeable future. Current efforts are underway to protect and restore Carnegie Library. In 2018 to 2019, we made repairs to rooftop leaks and replaced all the rooftop heating and cooling units. The plaster ceilings in the grand reading room were also repaired. Overgrown landscaping surrounding the building and threatening the building's foundation were replaced with plants in keeping with the original landscape design. Our next set of goals will be completed in phases over the next several years, with our top priority being to protect the building from water infiltration. This includes creating water barriers from top to bottom by replacing the roof, repointing exterior walls, and sealing the basement walls. Our second priority is to protect our historic collections further by adding new window treatments to reduce UV light exposure. Our third priority will include other details such as plaster and paint restoration, exterior door and tile repair. Typically, library operating funds do not include enough to complete more than small maintenance projects annually. Preservation projects of this scope require grants and additional community support. 
The challenges that we see in dealing with historic preservation, specifically the preservation of structures, is finances. It's, I mean, 98% of it is finding the money to do it. There's not a lot of what I call brick and mortar or hammer swinging type grants. There's a lot of grants for education or planning but not really for doing the work. So trying to fund that is, is pretty tough. Delaware County is a highly giving community. I think um, per capita, it gives more to nonprofits and to the needy than any other county in the United States, and second place isn't even close. So it's, it's, it highlights, this building, this library in a way, highlights so many things about Muncie. It's public library system, it's history through the building itself, it's attachment to Andrew Carnegie's program, and the fact that his philanthropy, in a way, is mirrored by our own activities today. Kind of what makes this library so important. It's one of the very few neoclassical style buildings that still exist in the downtown of Muncie. Um, you lose that asset, you'd never be able to afford to replace it again. The building materials and the craftsmanship, um, many times they just aren't there anymore. Um, that's what makes it so important to care for the assets and the resources that are our national heritage, our state heritage. When you have a site of history that you can't ever get back, and once you tear it down, that site's gone, you can't interact with it, you can't be a part of it, you can't experience it. Uh, the value, of hist obviously, of a restoring a historic building is innate to itself, right? You raise the value of that individual building, but then the effects of it spread out through the areas that are around it. So when you raise the value of my house, your house's value goes up. As long as they're comparable, and historic districts have very several comparable properties going up. So these historic properties, one of them gets uh, brought up uh, and rehabbed then the other ones have better value in them. The other thing is there's an economic development aspect to preservation jobs. One, the job is done here in your location. It's not shipped anywhere else. Two, it's skilled labor, so it's a little bit higher cost of labor. Three, is that it costs less to create a job in preservation than it does in most economic development packages. So when a city tries to attract jobs through an economic package of a, whatever it, it, that package may be, it usually costs somewhere around $50,000 for a job. Well, for um, preservation, that could be less than a tenth of that value for every um, project you're doing. So you can create far more better jobs by preserving these structures and you create all that value that you're putting back right into your neighborhoods and right into an equitable amount of folks around the area. Buildings in Europe last hundreds of years with proper care. We can do the same here if we choose to. Um, when you're looking at public buildings, you need to run formulas that although your solution might be more expensive in the short term, in the immediate present, the fact that the installation and the choice that you use to do that repair has a longer longevity if you actually calculate out inflation cost and the length of time for which you can guarantee that that repair choice is going to last, you've actually saved yourself immeasurable amounts of money in the future. Um, but many people never run those equations. They can only see right here what's in front of them in the present. And you're really not going to find in any of the buildings, especially like a Carnegie Library made out of limestone, no one's going to turn around and make another modern structure out of limestone like that. It's just um, not a practice that's going to happen. Whether it should or shouldn't is, it, is you know, neither here nor there, but you're not going to find that quality. It's the same thing like with slate roofs. Slate roofs are 100 years. Asphalt shingle, 10, 15, 20, depending on who does the installation and the quality. Why would you pick an asphalt shingle roof over a slate roof if you know your building is gonna last for 100 years or more? Um, because it's so much cheaper. But with rising cost, the slate roof will absolutely give you what you're looking for and protect that building 100 years. What is the cost of a roof in a hundred years. What, how many times are you going to repair your asphalt shingle roof and what will be that cost as it increases versus just putting up a large amount of money up front that gives you a quality product that gives you the hundred years. In, in conservation and in the preservation world, um, you can see there's indicators that there's a problem. Plaster spalling, plaster blooming, deterioration of the material and 
a lot of t many times the immediate response is let's fix that material then there's no problem but 100% of the time the rule of thumb always is you fix the cause you have to find the cause of that problem you need to fix that because fixing this one little item that is only basically a side effect of the real cause, the real issue, it's only aesthetically pleasing for a temporary period of time and you have to redo it over and over and over again. But if you can find that problem, find that cause, and water is always the number one issue with a building, um, you, you can just save so much money in the long run Why you are protecting and doing justice and service to that building and appreciating it as your cultural asset. It's our heritage. We can't get these things back once they're gone.